This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, the car show. Drive in anxious and cruise out confident. With the best automotive information for your vehicle, Bumper to Bumper, helping you and your car feel better. And now your hosts, Matt Allen and Dave Riccio. <laughs> it's cold, Dave. <laughs> it's cold. Good morning, everybody. And that's a chilly, uh, it's not even chilly, it's still downright cold Saturday morning. Welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen along with Dave Riccio, and together we are your KTAR car guys. As usual, here every Saturday from 11 to noon on 92.3 KTAR. And at Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are here helping you, the motoring public, the car owner, the motorist, the driver, uh, have a better overall car experience. Whether it's a car question, car problem, or you want to buy one, if you've got questions, we've got answers. So we encourage you to give us a call. Or you can even text. You can get involved with the show and send us messages and, and uh, communicate at 411-923. And, of course, the phone number, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap today, we've got an email of the week, open phones as always. And what should be on your auto repair invoice? I don't know, Dave. What what should be there? Well, as Cooper said, the good news is it's in writing. The bad news is it's in writing. And we, when we're at the Better Business Bureau, uh, looking at cases where there's complaint and resolution needs to be needs to happen, we're reading the paperwork. And the paperwork we find in most cases is so poor, we can't even decide decipher what took place. Well, I want to back it up a little bit. So, what you're talking about, Dave, when we're at the Better Business Bureau. We're not in there getting beat with the whip. Right. We are. We are in there as the automotive advisory committee. That's a group of you and I and, and a handful of other shop owners. That on a monthly basis or or uh, every other month now, I think things have calmed down a little bit. It used to be monthly, but the complaints <laughs> have come down. Uh, so we're going to be the the mediator of this uh, complaint between the consumer and the shop, and we want to do what we think is right, what really happened during this transaction. And even if you're not having that kind of problem, what's the purpose of the repair invoice? It's a document. It's a journal, right? Well, it should be a document of what happened, how the experience went down. And uh, this is not only to consumers, what you should expect to see on an invoice, but also to shops what you guys should be putting on invoices. Most shops I know, they do a good job of it, of really covering. And really, it's the, the four big things are the four C's. And what the four C's are going to be the customer concern. That's what you're experiencing in your word. So it'll usually read something like customer states, uh, so, engine running rough. So I'm going to come in, Dave, <laughs> and I'm the customer, and I'm going to say, you know, I've got this uh, trailblazer. Or, or what? Sorry, Doesn't sir, make... we're not going to service you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Be, so be the anyway, customer. I'll, I'll say that. I'll, I'll, I'll reserve comment. <laughs> so I'm the customer, and Dave, I have uh, my car's driving, and it seems like it does it mostly when it's cold, but it will still do it all the time. And the check engine light comes on, and the car just kind of stumbles and doesn't run real well. So that should be documented right there on the invoice. So what That's would you write the down? customer concern. Customer states, vehicle when running cold runs rough, you know, and... You're going to say what they said. I'm going to. I'm just going to. I'm just going to put it in their words what they said. So that would be C number one, customer concern. That's why they came to the shop. That always needs to be on the invoice when we're reviewing these cases at the at the on the advisory committee. We have no idea what they came in from. It just says Tuna. alternator and labor. You know why did you sell them an alternator? I I, I want to know what happened. What are the steps? So the first C is customer concern. Uh, the second C is going to be cause for the concern or the. Or the findings of the, the findings, well, the, the diagnosis. First, the first C, though, too. That's so the technician knows what's going on. Why is he looking at this car? Yeah, kind of like when you make the doctor's appointment. The doctor's got to know why. Why are you presenting today? Well, I think one of the things is sometimes people get a repair and that's not even what they wanted fixed. And so that I force our technicians. What did the customer ask for? What does the customer want? And then go right back in the customer's words what they are looking for from this trip to the auto shop. So that's very important. And then the uh, basically the cause for concern, what is the cause for the problem? So that might be in your trailblazer situation, something like this. Technician scanned the computer, found a diagnostic trouble code for cylinder misfire number three. So he knows, hey, I've got a 
you know, I've got a cylinder number three that's not rec- working right. Did a compression test, found a coil that is breaking down cold. You know, so that's that's the the problem that he found. So that's the cause. And then he's the correction is going to be to replace that number three cylinder coil and then retest. Because of the shop, and this is one thing I like to explain to people, is the shop, we know we have a bad link in the chain, but we don't know how the engine overall runs because right now we've got a bad coil. We have to fix that bad coil and then retest to make sure the engine is clear of any other problems. So, so the that, correction will be his the technician's recommended course of action to take care of what he found the problem relating to what you came in about. Correct. And right alongside that recommendation should be the price of what that recommendation costs to get it resolved. So parts and labor. I like to include sales tax and everything, so there's no surprises. Oh, yeah, that didn't include sales tax. I think the sales tax should be included when the price is quoted so you're not cut off guard. I was just reading. We were trying to do a little bit of research, and I searched what should be on my auto repair invoice. In the California, that's like communist country over there, <laughs> <laughs> they have the Bureau of Automotive Repair, which I, in some cases is probably very good, but in some places completely gets in the way of good people doing good business. Correct. They make rules that cover the bad people, whether it's a consumer. There are bad consumers and and, <laughs> and, and bad shops, but um, – you know, one of them, it, there was just ridiculous all the different things that you had to follow. Right. Uh, it was it was over the top. And what the, the reason for this topic is that I know that good walls make for good neighbors. If there's a wall between our house. I'll go over and I'll, ta- I'll knock on his door and I'll say hi and we may get together and barbecue. But there's still a wall. There's still a boundary. And it's good for the shop and it's good for the consumer. It's So if there is a problem, we can do what right is because we can always go back and see what happened last time we worked on the car. Well, okay, and then so that's the corrections. But then there, you would be surprised, everybody, when we look at these Better Business Bureau cases, and not just BBB cases. I don't care if it's a customer who brings in the records so we can find out what's yes. been happening in your car. Name, Mrs. Jones, or they put down Sally, and that's it. <laughs> um, we want your name. We need to know who we're dealing, doing with. We're going to have an exchange of money somehow. So I think I have the right to know where you live or how I find you if something goes wrong right. with that transaction. You're not buying movie tickets. There should be an address on the bill. Yeah, well, plus I want to send you a thank you card maybe or or something goes haywire. Maybe maybe there's a recall from uh, Michelin on the tires we put on your car, and we've got to get a hold of you because we've been warned that some tires that we sold or purchased uh, have a defect maybe. Uh, license plate, the vehicle identifiers, it's just not a blue Buick. It's got, a, it's got a VIN, vehicle identification yeah. number. That should be on the invoice. We want to Mileage know. in, mileage out, date in, date out. You I know? love mileage. You know, people get an engine overhaul and you see mileage in, 192,000, mileage out, 192,000. <laughs> we didn't even test drive it. Right. How's that working out? <laughs> Makes me feel good. <laughs> well, but it's a, it's a consistency. I think it, it shows the shop being diligent about the steps in their processes and their level of – not, not awareness, but I guess there is some awareness, but willing to document and put everything down. I know at my shop, you come into Virginia Auto Service, and I tell Tim or Robert, this thing is a journal. This, mm-hmm. If it's two years from now and somebody needs to pick up this piece of paper, they should pick this up and read it and know exactly what happened from start to finish. Why the car was here what we did and why we did it, and then a confirmation that it was correct. Well, that's the 4C. So we've got customer concern. We've got cause for concern. That's a diagnosis. And then we've got the recommendation, which is the correction. And then the fourth one is confirmation. So we installed the, we installed this new coil on cylinder number three, road-tested vehicle, 10 miles, taking it through the full operating range from cold to hot, and it works great. Good to go. No, further testing confirms it's fixed. You know, and sometimes it's a two test drive thing. I mean, we'll, we'll work on a car. Unfortunately, maybe the people leave, and the next day the light comes on, or they, mm. you know, it's a two step test drive. You can go back and look and say, "Gosh, we drove the car seven miles." But sometimes there's two drive cycles. You have to cycle the key. We do th- we do three test drives on every major repair. Three test drives. So the guy that installs the transmission, he goes for three miles. He puts it back up in the air. Then we have somebody else go five miles on the highway, five miles on the surface street, bring it back. And then the guy that checked it in, he's the guy that's going to ultimately confirm we fixed the problem. So he goes and drives it again because he's the perfect person to confirm it. So Now, a lot of shop management software is made to be very easy so that, that uh, you know, it's fast and efficient. So... When you get that invoice from the shop and they told you one thing over the telephone, 
this, the line item shouldn't just read diagnosis ninety nine dollars. What did you find? This is a lot when we were talking earlier, David. It's kind of like the medical chart. Mm. It's in there. Everything's down. And they should go over it with you when you leave. And and a lot of people they don't really care. You know what's the bottom line and you know that type of thing. And that sounds about like what you told me on the phone. But you know what? The, one of the frustrating things is, well, I had some work done on my car. What would you have done? Not really sure. But so, I spent $1,000. <laughs> but I spent $1,000. We've got Daniel and Randy in open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. And you can also text us at 411-923. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, good morning and welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Matt Allen, and I don't have Dave Riccio with me anymore today. He has abandoned me after the first segment. I think he uh, went to go get a drink of water and has not come back. But in the first segment, we were talking about what should be on your auto repair invoice. So if you've got a a repair shop invoice, maybe you went out and spent some money and you're not sure what you got, pull that invoice out and see if it has the things on there that we talked about, the the your name, your address, your telephone number with the with the VIN number and uh, and uh, mileage and all the things. What happened with your auto repair? Did they put down what they found and what the fix was? And is it itemized? And have sales tax under Dave? How many of these things do we see in the Better Business Bureau? Usually they're in Apache Junction <laughs> when they look like this, <laughs> but they have uh, engine fifteen hundred. Uh, parts, <laughs> gaskets, uh, labor. Put the motor in, and and then uh, you know, and then and there's no sales tax. But what I find interesting, you look at the parts list. Where's the coolant? Didn't you put some mm-hmm. new oil on this? Right. Or is that just part of the? Did parts? we get a water pump on that engine? Did we get yeah. valve cover? What did we get? <laughs> so. We yeah. see some really bad invoices. Did you find your drink of water while you were out? I did. Matt's like, bit? oh, we got two minutes. Should be fine. <laughs> and I came back. I was like, not, I didn't have two minutes. You did have two minutes. You're just not very efficient, <laughs> apparently. I got to move I, faster. So we've got, up for the segment, we've got Daniel in Avondale on a 1994 Chevy 1500 pickup. Go ahead, Daniel. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. Uh, my time was the first time caller. Um, I took my 94 Chevy to a shop to get an engine installed and uh the starter bolts broke off into the engine block so i couldn't extract them and now my shot uh took them five weeks to install my motor and they told me it'd take two weeks i took possession of my uh truck for two days and it stopped running and i am a uh, fellow technician as well so I adjusted my timing. I put a fuel filter in and put a starter in, and it still wouldn't start. So I shipped it back to the place that did my engine, and they're saying that I sabotaged my own motor by doing all of those repairs. You did what? I just adjusted my timing. Right. Now, I understand what you did, but what did you do by doing those repairs? What did they say you had done? That I poured something down my throttle body. Okay. So now are they able to fix the car? Or are they telling you that you caused damage to something by what you did? That I I caused some sort of foreign matter to go into the intake. And is there damage to the engine now? Yes, sir. There's uh, damage to the cylinder wall. Mm, okay. Well, how much did you pay for this engine job? Uh, 23. 2300 Okay. Um, well, there's a couple things, Dave. You know, twenty three hundred dollars to put an engine in a, I'm assuming a V8 engine in a '94 Chevy truck is too cheap. Mm. That's that's the first. Uh, that's one of the first things that that uh, came to my mind. I don't know where you buy that. Maybe you get a used one somewhere. But gosh, just the labor alone mm-hmm. in most shops, I'm thinking, is that amount of money? That's a fifteen or twenty hour job, and at a hundred dollars an hour, round numbers. Fifteen hundred bucks right we're, there. We're too cheap to start with, so we haven't bought oil and coolant and an engine. You haven't and even bought parts. Yeah, exactly. Um, the notion that you put something down the throttle body and caused cylinder wall damage, I don't know what that would have been. I guess in hindsight, maybe it would have been better off not to touch it and just take it back to them. Right. Uh, which I still think is. I mean, gosh, I don't know. You it, you could have an uphill battle right now. They, I don't, if you're at a stalemate, they said this, you said that. I don't know. It would be worth pulling an oil sample of that oil and see what's in there 
And then uh, once we learn that, that might point us in another direction. But why would, if it took him five weeks to get his car back, why would he want to break it for five more weeks? It, it, there's no rationale in that, yeah. in that or no logic to that. So I, th- I think, you know, if this is a legitimate shop uh, that's doing business here in town, you know, give them a, you know if, you, if you guys aren't talking, well, maybe it is worth to go see the Better Business Bureau and see if you guys can get it resolved and use them as the entity to help do that. They're, they don't, they're not going to take sides. They're just going to keep the lines of communication open so you guys can come to what's a reasonable solution. Well, and that goes back to another uh, one of the things that was brought up when I was looking at the BAR, Bureau of Automotive Repair for California, and it's one thing, one of many things that I agree with. Is it says, do I have to get a receipt when I go in for warranty work? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. You don't want to. And I mean, we're guilty of this. Sometimes you go into the shop and, oh, just a quick adjustment. I'm really sorry about that, Mrs. Jones. Here you go. Here's your keys. Yeah. We want to do that because we want it to be convenient and get them out and, and, right. and, and stop that inconvenience. But really, we should stop, document what happened, why they came in, and memorialize that event. And from the consumer standpoint, you want to do that because when you ha- if, unfortunately, you have to go have that battle or have that fight, Oh, we don't have any record of that, or, or they didn't bring it. They didn't bring it back three times. Oh yeah, I did. I got the receipts right here. Not so. even if you have a problem, but let's say you're at the next shop. You're at my shop. We're looking at something in the transmission. We think we have another issue with the engine. Well, I had some work done on that. Well, what'd you have done? Oh, I don't know. You know. So if I can get that paperwork, and that paperwork actually makes sense to me, okay, here's what the technician, here's what the customer wanted, here's what the technician found. Here's what they did. Well, that's going to stop us from doing the same repair twice or oh, in, anything like that. So it's going to save you money in the long run. You know, so that should be an expectation is from you as the customer. Don't get all you know legalistic about it. Got to have paperwork. Put that in writing, darn it. It just it just should be a brochure of how the experience went down, what you did, why you did what you did, uh, and then for the businesses, same thing. So I can when I get a paperwork from a, from a customer and I'm doing a repair, if I see something you guys just did, I'm going to give you a courtesy call. You know, so we can work together as, sh- you know, as shops, well, but this should be a standard. It's, it's a baseline. It should it, be on the invoice. And as the shop owner, if I'm going through the paperwork and I see, okay, no char or this, oh, wow, this is a comeback. She was here two days ago. This is a, a, a re, a relook. Why? And then you go and talk to the technician. What happened? Is there a learning experience here? Do we have a bad part? Was it poor communication in the office? We didn't tell the customer. Maybe the customer didn't read that receipt, which they never do. Uh, no, or, they never do. That's or, why I go over it with or them. Or we didn't hear. explain it to them. you know. So maybe there's just something that got, so we need to we need to learn from all these. So there should be receipts. So Daniel, good luck with that. I think um, you've got to go back to the shop. You've got to at least them give them an opportunity, gather the documentation. I hope you didn't drop something down the intake, but it just it, it doesn't make sense to me. Right, but you can get a if you send me an email, I can connect you with Lab One to do an oil sample. They do a great job, and they can see what's in there. Maybe it was its material. Is it material from a bushing? Is it material from a piston? What is the material that's in there? I think it's funny that you're cold this morning, uh, you know, because you got more meat on uh, on you <laughs> than me. How do we parlay from oil samples that you're going to start picking on me now? You know, first he's got no hair on his head. That's first, why he's cold. Well, I'm bald. You know, bald is beautiful. First of all, so I go and it's cold, man. You go outside and and just not. I don't even really grow much fuzz anymore. This baby's like shiny, bald, but but even just having a little bit of fuzz, almost like your beard helps my head. But mm. I mean, I'm thinking you're like the woolly mammoth. Here. I am lined with hair. <laughs> the only thing that bothers my wife is that mane of hair on my back. You know, she wants to wax that baby off. Does it stand up when you get mad? <laughs> <laughs> it, it does actually. Is it like a cat, kind of. <laughs> so, hey, one other thing I, is: are handwritten invoices okay for auto shops? You know, I think they're acceptable, but we can banter that out for sure. When we come back, we've got Omar, Randy, and Brad, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, if you own a car, you have got your radio on the right station. Bumper to Bumper Radio every single Saturday from 11 to noon. I'm Matt Allen. This other guy that made it back from the break is Dave Riccio. And as I said, every Saturday we are here talking about cars, car repair, uh, maybe you need a body shop, you had that unfortunate accident, you don't know how to talk to the people that are fixing your car, whatever it's got to do with your car ownership experience. 
We are here to help you. And Dave, you know, I noticed something this morning. I hate talking to you. <laughs> well, not anymore. Let me, let me qualify that a little bit. I mean, we talk a lot. And it seems we talk a lot on the cell phone. I'm usually in the bathroom, and you usually <laughs> there's <laughs> always an echo when I'm talking to Matt. And the faucet rings, and there's well, a flush going it's on. It's no worse than the echo you had from your your hooped up, jerry rigged, wired in uh, whatever concoction of a stereo that you had in your hot rod element. You talk to you, and it's like feedback and reverb on the cell phone. And I noticed this morning it's nice and crystal Crisp and clear. Crystal clear. Did you treat yourself to, uh, early present, or what? What's going on with that? Well, I did, and I want to give a shout out to these guys. I, you know, I drive a Honda Element. I like nice accessories. I wanted to stream my cell phone into my stereo, you but still? I didn't want to buy a different stereo. I told them I want to make it work with a factory deck. So they said, "Well, we don't generally like to do this, but we can put this little parrot device on there. It's one option we can do." Put it in. I didn't like it. So I said, I don't like it. And they said, well, we can change it out. A little bit more money. We're going to go ahead and put a stereo in there for you. It's going to do everything you want it to do. So I put it in there. And it was in there for quite a while. But it started having a little bit of issues. So I called them up. And I said, it's real intermittent. But once in a while, it blanks out. And i got to do a reset on it. And i got to reset all my favorite stations, including this one. And uh, so uh, they said, we'll just swap it out. you know." And uh, they swapped it out. And they were pleasant. You know, three times I went back for my stereo needs, and every time I went back there, these guys were fantastic. And at the end of the day, I said, it was Mark I was talking to, Dave's the owner down there, but Mark is the manager, and I said, I really appreciate the way you guys treated me. I know this has not been a profitable, pro profitable experience for you guys. And he said, profit it. What does that matter? We made a customer. You're a customer for life. So if you guys need a good stereo shop, sounds good to me. They're like Broadway and roughly hardy. But uh, I got my car stereo from them. They've been in the Valley for 20 years, so I've gotten other car stereos from them. They've been fantastic the whole way through. And a good stereo shop with the modern car with all the modules is definitely something you want. So uh, you can send me an email, and I can give you a referral over there, or just give Mark or Dave a call. Uh, good Christmas gift, too, as well. <laughs> since it's I, Dave, I think we have an ever-patient Randy on the line in Gilbert with the 2010 Nissan Frontier. We need to help him. Randy, what can we do for you today? Oh, I'm sitting here in my flannel shirt, so I'm staying warm. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a Nissan Frontier. It's a V6 six-speed, and I'm coming up on about 55,000 miles. And I don't know if you can uh, suggest a general maintenance uh, checklist for repair at this point in time. Well, the first thing I would do is go to your owner's manual. And you're, right. You're probably going to find a um, a severe in normal maintenance but you know dave i'm really even seeing those they're breaking down severe normal dusty hot i mean there's all kinds right. of conditions and we probably fit in all of those uh 2010 nissan i'm going to imagine at 55,000 miles there's not a whole lot that you're going to find in the in the owner's manual maybe a transfer case service transmission, transmission. and i think what really the number is we're probably at 60,000 miles that's where I would do my cutoff. That's traditionally where the mileage interval is on that car, 30, 60, 90, 120. Sometimes you see something in there around 105,000. But I, I like to try and keep on track. So at 60, great. Then we redo that at 120. We don't have this, oh, I did something at 55 and I did something at 62 or, or 67. But I would start there. And, and you're going to have things, your cabin air filter, or the, the interior filter. You're going to have the, the engine air filter. Of course, we're going to check the brakes and the tires. Probably too early for much else, but I think that's where you go in your shop and, and, and have a discussion with them. What do you see? What's the, what's the car need off your inspection? What's it need according to the manufacturer? And then tell me a little bit about your experience. What are you going to recommend? I like the reference of the factory manual. That's a good thing. Go see what the manual says. But it's not, in my mind, it's not the, you know, ends all of what the maintenance should be because we've talked about the maintenance out of those books. And sometimes there may be a little bit marketing directive. They want to advertise, hey, we're selling cars that are maintenance-free, that type of thing. So some of the services aren't frequent enough. Some of them are too much. That's where the relationship comes in. You're in Gilbert. If you don't have a shop, we've got Desert Car Care out there. Probably one of the best guys to talk to out there is Brian. Talk with him about maintenance and what you should be doing. So always reference the factory manual. And if someone tells you something that's different than the manual, just have them explain to you why. You know, why 
uh, why should I do it more frequent than manual? You know, I've heard some guy saying that you don't need to do brake fluid services. Well, you know what? On your European cars, they say, yeah, every two years it needs to be done. And I think that is a good recommendation. You know, every time you're doing brakes on it, maybe that's a good time to flush the brake fluid. So, uh, but reference the manual to see what it says. It's not always right, but that's where a little bit of knowledge comes in alongside of it. Uh, the bottom line is just a very good starting point. Right. It's a that, point of reference. That That's what it is. So you keep care of that 2010 Frontier, and you'll be in very good shape. And you can find Desert Car Care on bumper2bumperradio.com. So, Dave, what do you think? Omar in Phoenix has a 2004 Accord. Omar, what can we help you with today on Bumper to Bumper? How you guys doing? I uh, appreciate you guys taking my call. I got uh, 2004 Accord, the full of the... Uh, it just give me, uh, I have sold it 74,000 miles in there, but this car is just like giving me a problem for a couple of money when it's cold. It goes like, last a couple of seconds, then it kicks in. Just a longer crank? Yes. Before it actually fires over. And th- is that something new on these cold mornings we've had the last four or five days? Or when you say cold, does that mean it still could be 80 degrees outside, but is it first startup? The car is nice and warm. It started up right away. Only when I get up in the morning, it started up about a month ago. When it started getting just a little bit tiny cold, that's what it's not doing. Okay. Well, short of having any any check engine lights or any any failure, anything on that would suggest that you have a failure, there's a couple things that need to happen when that car starts up. You're going to turn the key on, and the computer is going to go out and look at a whole bunch of various sensors. And in your case, um, one of the ones in, in all cars are going to go look at an engine coolant temperature sensor. The cars don't have a choke anymore like they did when it was carbureted. So that engine coolant temperature sensor uh, is going to go out and look and confirm, hey, it's 31 degrees out here today. And it's going to tell that information to the computer. So when you start the car, it's going to have an increased idle. It's going to have more fuel delivery. And, and we're going to try and get this car warmed up. If that engine coolant temperature sensor is lying to the computer and telling it, it's 150 degrees on the engine already. That engine is going to be starving for fuel and is not going to want to start. It is not going to run very good for the the initial startup. That could be a problem. You know, overdue maintenance. I wasn't. I didn't quite hear if you said at 180 thousand or 80 thousand. You could have worn out spark plugs. You get. Uh, a couple, you know, get some dirty fuel injectors, a little bit of carbon buildup. And it it's all not, adds up. And it's not necessarily one thing. We'll get this car in the shop, Dave, or, or something, this story like this, and you can't pinpoint any one thing wrong, but you see spark plugs with the electrodes rounded off. You have a throttle body that is nasty, dirty. So sometimes we have to do some maintenance and, and get you healthy in general and get the foundation right before we can make the car run right. Well, the other thing, too, is our batteries, can they show up weaker when it's cold like that? I mean, the cold's got to affect the battery. That's why they call it cold cranking amps. Absolutely. Cranking over a little slower, voltage a little less. So good time to check out batteries instead of buying them in July <laughs> when it's hot and you've been standing on the parking lot. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't like to buy my summers, my battery in the summer, and I don't like to buy one from the roadside battery peddler that you called when you wanted to jump start <laughs> and you're trying to cram a battery down your throat. <laughs> I want to make unpressured decisions, I guess. So, Well, we've got a text here on a uh, 2006 uh, Chevrolet Equinox. It sounds like he needs a heater core, and he's asking for a recommended shop. He didn't put what part of town he was in. Send us an email at bumper to bumper radio dot com. Here, cores is just not a fun repair because you got to. What goes on with that, Matt? You're pulling the dashboard out a lot of times. If it, some have access panels, maybe, but it's a big deal. There's sometimes there's way to sneak and you can get these things out, but man, the way the dashes are nowadays, I almost quit a job. <laughs> <laughs> I was not an interior guy. I was drivability and performance and stuff. And I think it was a Nissan Maxima. It was probably the late 80s or early 90s, and what a disaster. Sir, we got your heater core all done. Here's the box of extra parts. Um, <laughs> you go ahead and keep those. If any rattles show up in the future, just see if you can jam one somewhere. It might make a difference, but otherwise, I don't know what they can <laughs> Exactly. Do. Heater cores are not a fun job. And Dave, we've got another one. Uh, boy, we had some more come in. 2006 Scion XB. When do I change the timing belt? And on this one, I can report never. Negative. Uh, it's a lifetime time. 
<laughs> no, there is no lifetime timeout. That Cyan XB does not have a timeout. It's a timing chain. I noticed a lot of cars going back to chains, like my Honda is a four cylinder. It's got a chain in it. Yeah. No more, no more stretchy belt. A little rubber band in there. Don't care for that. They all had chains in the beginning. They go belts. This, the, the pendulum is swinging back to the. Uh, you know, back to the chain. So in your Scion, you don't have to worry about it. And you're right, Dave. A lot of them are coming out back with chains. It again. seems like on the the longer lengths, the belt is going away because there's just more area for stretch. You know, but on your V6s, most of them are still belts. But uh, four cylinders, maybe not. So anyway, well, let's see if we can. Uh, you know what? Let's go to the email of the week. And I had an email this week. Let me see if I can pull it up from Mike S. Uh, looks like he's got a 2003 Honda Accord. He's only got 80,000 miles on it, so he doesn't drive a whole bunch. But he was at a dealer shop for an oil change, and they told him he had cracked tie rod boots. His question is, what are those? What is the purpose? And is it this a necessary repair for $300? Will it cost me any more money down the road if I ignore it for now? So what do you think, Matt? Boots, $300, tie rod ends. What are you thinking? Um we get this question a lot for some reason on <laughs> Hondas. I don't know if it's just it's the gravy that drips off of Hondas at the dealerships or something, but if they said tie rod boots, the only other boot typically up front is going to be a, a ball joint. I mean, a, uh, well, there's CV boots boot. on your ball joints, but CV boot CV is, boot. is the, other, the other big boot that fails. Um, I, I see this occasionally and i can tell the people sometimes we'll get a, a a phone call about this and i was at the dealer and they said i need this and then they said some boots i said let me guess tie rod boots and it's 300 dollars. yep run and hide <laughs> you don't need it and, and what that boot is on on most car a lot of cars not even most anymore it used to be the american versus jap not versus japanese but american cars you're pumping there's zerk fittings or grease fittings everywhere on the car you grease the joints on a regular basis in the hondas and toyotas a lot of japanese cars didn't have them at all and now we see a lot of cars don't have them but what this dust boot or what the boot does it keeps the dust out and to the extent that there's lubricant in that ball joint or in that tie rod in it keeps the lubricant in and, and when we do a, a reinspect on some of these, sometimes we see these cracks that go all around the boot. And sometimes it's cracked all the way through, and, and sometimes it's not. And that is such an easy job. I mean, you could probably literally do it in 20 minutes, and there's 6 or $7 worth of rubber boots, but they're charging $300 to do it. Well, and, how much? I mean, it doesn't sound like a whole lot more to just put a whole new tie rod well, in there. Well, that's what we find. I, I, I'll pull up in the estimate to do a tie rod end, and, hell, you're not spending $20 more than you would be to do the the whole job with new tie rods. So, you know, what are you saving by doing that? You're not saving anything. You've got 80,000 miles on a joint that's going to last 100. Why would you spend $300 to pr- protect a $40 part? It's the that same job. Sense. Yeah. Well, these are just samples of the emails we get every week. We get people looking for, should I do this repair? Shouldn't I do this repair? We get people looking for shops. bumper to bumperradio.com on the contact link. You can send Matt and I an email. Uh, and uh, you can also find good shops there, bumper to bumperradio.com. Well, we've got Bud, David, Danny, and Eddie. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and I am furry and warm. Matt is bald and cold, and it is cool this morning, but I do enjoy it. So we're taking your phone calls and answering your questions, and we're also topping like mad during the breaks to answer a lot of these texts. So we are going to go with Bud in Mesa on a 2012 Nissan Pathfinder. Go ahead, Bud. What can we help you with? Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for being there. Um, just a real quick question. I've got a, the uh, Nissan. Bought it used at about 7,000 miles. Had it, we've had it now for about five months. And in the last probably three months, we've noticed that when we're stopped at intersections um, or otherwise it's idling, it will periodically start to vibrate fairly significantly um, and pretty noticeably. It's not all the time. But it, uh, it's pretty regular that it does this, whether it's in gear and we're at a uh, stop at a light or something, or uh, occasionally when it's in park as well. And I, last time I had it in to be serviced, I asked the, uh, the dealership about it, and my thought was maybe motor mounts or something was bad, and, and they said that those all look fine. 
and how, they didn't have any other explanation for me. Any thoughts or just something not to worry about? How often do you feel it? Like, give me, you know, does it happen once a day, once a week, oh, no. once a month? Every every time it's out. And do they do they feel do they feel the vibration you're talking about when you're working with the dealer? You know, the the only time I actually had it in there was um, during this uh, oil change service on the vehicle, and I asked them about it, and they said like, we couldn't feel anything. But everything looked okay. Okay. Well, on my my thing like that, if you know, if it went in for an oil change, a lot of shops and dealerships they just have the lube guy. They've, they've got the kid that does oil changes. Hey, did you notice anything vibrating? Ah, this thing's only got uh, twelve thousand miles. Brand new car. Nothing they're, wrong with it. Nothing, they're just going to blow it out. They've got, you know, they're there to produce those oil changes and crank those things out in thirty minutes, or it's free kind of deal. You're not getting the attention that the car needs there. I would probably suggest it's a new enough vehicle. Go there, make your appointment. Get the service rider in the car with you. Yeah, I have this problem, and like we talked about in the beginning, right? Here's what it is, and, and you can even document that for them. Here's when we feel it, and if they can't, if they're really on their game, they're going to say, "Well, let's go, show me, or get right. the technician. Let's feel this together, so we 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 all know what we're talking about, or at least referring to." Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and 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 but if they or if they go the other route and say, "Oh, we'll check it out. We can't find anything." Great. When I come pick it up, if I can duplicate this, one of you will come with me, right? And then at least get them to acknowledge we have a problem. Right. And then they'll start affecting some type of repair. And get it on the work order. And, and that's one of the things that I run into. People have new cars and it's doing a noise they don't think is quite right or whatever. I always say the car's so new, you can go find another 2012 Nissan Pathfinder on the lot and you can go with a service rider and sit in your car. And you guys just feel that? Oh, that's normal. Okay, let's go sit in another one. Yeah, let's see. You go sit in another one and. You know, that one doesn't, you know, that one feels totally different. Well, you know, was there a difference? Yes. So what's the level of acceptability, especially on something that's so subjective, like a vibe, you know, a little vibe, it could be a little rough vibration. Is that normal? But I couldn't imagine having any motor mount problems like that. It's too new, Way typically. too new. So thanks so much for the call, bud. We are going to go with Eddie in Mesa on a 1976 Chevy van. Go ahead, Eddie. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got a G30 350 four barrel with 105,000 miles, and I've had it since it was new. And the last few months, I've been it's been missing and getting worse and worse. And I finally brought it home. I keep it in a storage area, and uh, I have found that the uh, driver's side of the engine is running fine on, on on that side of the exhaust pipe, and then the passenger side of the exhaust is you can put your hand over it and shut it off. It doesn't even get hot, and it's almost no exhaust coming out at all. Mm. It's like one half of the engine's not running. Well, I don't think that the that the uh, engine would discriminate and only wear out the rings, say, on maybe half the engine or something like that. So I'm thinking, while not necessarily a mechanical problem, it's still although- gotta be still got to be pumping air. Pistons are still going up and down. It's got to be shooting some down that exhaust pipe on that side. But I'm thinking it's restricted or clugged up. And well, there's, have- there's. No cats back there in 1976. Be a convert. There's nothing to to plug it up. But if it's got a huge vacuum leak, right. intake manifold gasket leaking, it's not going to fire, and therefore you're not going to have any flame, and you're not going to be hot on that cylinder. You could have, you know, I don't know how the intake manifold whether whether one plane feeds one side or if one and three are are on one side and five and seven are, are, are two and six are fed by a different plane or a different side of the carburetor. You could have half the carburetor plugged up possibly, maybe the idle circuit. Um, 76, though, should be that, that difficult. Uh, get it into a, a shop. There's got to be bound to be somebody in Mesa like Accurate Automotive. 76 is probably right up their alley to, uh, you know, to handle that. You're older than I am, so, you know, it's <laughs> so, like, well, you know, some I, people come in and they say, how do you guys work on these modern cars? And I'm like, oh, man, I love the modern <laughs> car. When the old one comes in, I'm like, I got to pick up the phone. We have a, a transmission from like a 1955 Jaguar in our shop. And uh, I had to call Leon up the other day. I said, hey, Leon, <laughs> Dave, uh, what are you doing this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> Looking at a 55 Jaguar transmission. Can you put that in your calendar? Right. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't even know how to work on the old cars. Well, you can't plug into it. You know, and there's a whole lot more diagnostic that goes from just plugging in. And plugging in is just a starting point. So there's a lot of concepts that run in our mind that we know, okay, this affects this, this affects that. 
we have the concept, so we can kind of talk through it. This is the one where you want the old guy that uh, has been oh, around yeah. the block for a while. Been there, is... done that, won that T-shirt ten times over. He'll he'll tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. So anyway, the the but the feedback that I want everybody to walk away from here today is the auto repair invoice. Getting one if you're going back to the dealership and you're complaining about a vibration, get an invoice that states that. What if they the, didn't charge me, Dave? Didn't charge you to check it out? Well, you should still, still say, well, can I pay you for an invoice? Because I want an invoice. What would you find? Because, you know, I got it for free. Well, what would you get? Well, nothing. <laughs> but if someone's taken the steps to look into something, have them take a minute, just document it. That way, you know, six months from now, oh, I had a shop look at that. What did they do? I have no idea. Because, you know what, my memory is just not that good. Well, Dave, I was the, a technical advisor for Ford Motor Company on Lemon Law dispute cases and that would be one of the things in, in this 2012 very well could fall under that lemon law category Absolutely. I, I don't know start, that, that the type of repair or whatnot is start the paperwork trail. but if you have documentation that would be a problem well i went in but there was no documentation the order well we don't have any record i'm bringing in you have to have a certain amount of documentation to go through these so through these steps so whether you paid or not whether it's under warranty document it Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's cold out there, but it's nice and warm in the studio. If you're looking for a great shop, BumperToBumperRadio.com. While you're there, find our Facebook link, bottom left side of the screen. Be sure to like us. Matt and I always like new friends. Thanks, Peter, for running the dials. Remember never to text and drive. Put the phone down. Don't be tempted. Next weekend, we're talking about Santa's shopping list for automotive goodies. What's out there? One more thing you can cross off your list. We'll see you next week.